just going to say real quick, hello all, welcome to our public meeting. If you'd like to join us in Spanish, please go to the link in the chat. There's a link in the chat for that. Hola a todos, si prefieres esta, esta conversación en español, hay un enlace en el chat. Gracias. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our first public conversation about reimagining regional rail. Uh, here at SEPTA, we're really excited to get this after underway. My name is Jody Holton. I'm the Assistant General Manager for Planning and Strategic Initiatives at SEPTA. And uh, we're very happy to see this active participation uh, in this in this project already. We have a survey online about regional rail and we've already received 5,000 responses in just three weeks. So as many of you know, regional rail is a vital part of SEPTA's transit network and it provides connections all across the region. We have an incredible legacy of rail infrastructure. We have two amazing uh, railroad companies that came through Philadelphia, the Reading and the Pennsylvania. And they were connected through the Center City Commuter Rail Tunnel. Today, our ridership is about 30% of pre-pandemic levels. And while that's up from a low point of 3% in the spring of 2020, uh, we know we need to adapt to a changing ridership and travel patterns. So reimagining regional rail is, is the first part of our efforts to do just that. And now I want to introduce to you uh, Ryan Judge, who's also in the planning department in SEPTA, and he'll be the project manager for this project. Ryan? Thanks, Jody. So we're, we're really excited to get this process started tonight, and I think we have a, a great agenda with some really interesting materials to walk through to give everyone an idea of the, uh, the types of things that we're going to be looking at as we go through this process. So we're already underway with some introductions, as you see there on the screen, and we'll introduce some more of the team members in a minute or so. Uh, but before we get to that, we'll spend some time talking about how this effort fits in with SEPTA Ford, which is our new strategic plan, and provide an overview of the regional rail system as it is today. While we're just getting started on more in-depth analysis and some work behind the scenes, we'll provide some, some insights and some thoughts on early findings as part of the existing conditions. Uh, we've organized this information into four key areas, which we'll walk through in a little bit more detail. History, infrastructure and operations, connectivity, and demand. And as mentioned, we're just getting started. So we have a lot of work ahead of us. We'll wrap up with some information on what to expect from the process as we move forward before jumping into Q&A. So over the next hour, hour or so, we're looking to keep you all busy. Uh, we don't want this just to be us speaking at you. So there'll be two primary methods for interacting, a few live polls that'll pop up on your screen at certain times. And then of course, the typical chat function to see some questions already coming in as we go ahead. Uh, so feel free to put any questions, comments, general thoughts that you have in the chat box as we move forward. We'll answer things that are pretty quick and easy in the chat as we go through. We'll put the rest in a parking lot for the Q&A at the process at the end. And then for your general thoughts or feedback, we welcome that in the, Q &A, in the chat as well. We'll pull that in and incorporate it into all the great feedback that we've received from the survey and pop-up events we've had across the region. We're not going to waste any more time. We're going to jump off with uh, one poll to get started, because we know a lot of this group is really excited to get into it. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward question whether or not you've taken the survey. As Jody mentioned, we've had more than 5,000 responses. So we're really excited about that feedback. We want to get an idea of who's here tonight as part of that. It's a pretty straightforward question, but it makes sure that we have the polling function set up properly and gets you all uh, familiar with how we're going to go through this process tonight. All right, so as we mentioned earlier, reimagining regional rail is a key initiative of SEPTA Ford, which is our new strategic plan to revamp our services and better connect people across the region. We know that the pandemic has had a tremendous impact not only on transit ridership, but how people live their lives every day. And so SEPTA Ford lays out a framework to transform our organization and the services that we provide. So it's a clear vision for the future with transit at the core of a resilient, prosperous, and equitable community for everyone. We know that the typical nine to five commute pattern will not be coming back the same as it was before. So we need to adapt our transit to make sure it serves all types of trips, no matter when or where you are trying to go. And what we mean by that is that transit is the first choice of travel for everyone, that it's not the mode of last resort. So to do this, we are creating a lifestyle transit network that meets the needs of our region today and tomorrow. We're focused on making sure that all of our services work together as one lifestyle network 
through the work that we have ongoing with Bus Revolution, which is our comprehensive redesign of the bus network, the Route Transit Wayfinding Master Plan, which is looking at how we treat all of our route transit lines as one unified system, and here with Reimagining Regional Rail, which will lay out our vision for regional rail. To help us out, we brought in a team of experts on rail and transit planning. They're helping us to make sure that we are incorporating best practices and industry leading thought processes from around the world, not only into the analysis and recommendations, but also into our engagement with people across the region to make sure that we're reaching everyone. So Christoph Spieler is a professional engineer and a certified planner is leading the team that is supporting SEPTA. We're really excited to have him on. I'll hand it over to you, Christoph, so you can introduce the rest of your team and your own background. Thanks. Excellent. I'm Christoph Spieler at Hewitt Zollers, and I'm joined by a couple of the members of our very talented consulting team that is working on this project. Um, you'll also hear today from Teresa Carr at Nelson Nygaard and Susie Birdsell at Nelson Nygaard, as well as Madeline Pelzel at Hewitt Zollers. And we are also all looking forward to talking to you in the Q&A later. So let's start here. A century ago, two different railroad companies built electric commuter rail lines across the Philadelphia region. And in 1984, SEPTA used a new downtown tunnel to connect them into a single network. And the following year, the airport line opened, creating a critical connection for the region and creating the network we know today. Um, as a result, we have the best regional rail infrastructure in North America. And this is a funny statement because some people have actually argued this one with me, but I'd say whichever city you want to bring up, I can tell you how this Philadelphia network is better. Or if you look at Boston, for example, it's a network that has a lot of single track lines, whereas most of the SEPTA regional rail network is double track. If you look at New York City, each one of those lines goes only to a single station in Midtown Manhattan, whereas if you get on regional rail, you have a choice of three center city stations plus Temple University to go to. If you look at Chicago, you see a system that has only a little bit of electrification versus SEPTA is entirely electrified and a system that has to share a lot of track with freight rail. Um, where SEPTA has only minimal freight rail interference. And if you compare to a place like Washington DC, you'll see that SEPTA's network is much more extensive and serves many more parts of the region. Now, I say infrastructure because that doesn't necessarily mean the best service. And as you can see in this picture, it doesn't necessarily mean the newest trains, um, but there is a set of infrastructure across this region that we can really take advantage of. And before COVID 132,000 people rode that network every day and regional rail makes their lives better. You can imagine, for example, a commuter coming in from Paoli to work in Center City, saving 20 minutes every day and not having to sit in traffic for that commute. Um, you can imagine a college student at Delaware Valley University taking the train to a concert in Center City and not having to own a car because that network connects them to the region. But we also know that regional rail leaves people behind. Um, if you think of an office worker who lives in Taconi, maybe taking the 56 bus to Center City instead of regional rail because regional rail fares are higher than bus fares. Um, you might have a Philadelphia resident who works out in Exton, but can't take the rail because there's no connection from that station to their office. And as a result of that, they have to own a car and get on the freeway. Um, a student at Penn Medicine, um, who takes the trolley, even though regional rail would be a shorter walk because the trolley comes more often all day than the regional rail train does. Um, or a Mount Airy resident who takes the bus because they cannot get their wheelchair on the train. So our question with this project is, can regional rail work for them as well? The Reimagining Regional Rail got its inception from SEPTA forward, the agency's five-year strategic plan. As Ryan referenced earlier, SEPTA 4's goal is to create one lifestyle transit network, unified and equitable, serving all kinds of trips, no matter where you are or what mode you choose. Next slide. Our project will create a vision for this lifestyle transit network. Next slide. We begin with a hypothesis that if regional rail provides frequent all day bi-directional service, which is well connected with local transit, with integrated fares that is accessible and easy to use, next slide, then we will see an increase in riders, an increase in equity, an increase in access and customer satisfaction and with wider economic benefits felt at the regional level. Next slide. 
The work we've done to date and have ongoing is testing this hypothesis. We need to know, is the demand there? Next slide. How can we improve equity? Next slide. Where are the bottlenecks in the system and how can we address these bottlenecks to provide the service to meet demand? Next slide. We begin our work by spending time on the trains, in the stations, talking with conductors, with maintenance staff, with riders, and with the community, asking you how regional rail could be more useful. As of today, as Jody mentioned, we've received over 5,000 responses to our survey and spoken with 1,200 people during our two days of pop-up events next week, last week. Next slide. We've also been in the field, riding the trains and exploring the system. This time has helped to inform the way we move forward. We've developed four categories under which our conclusions to date fall. These are history, infrastructure and operations, connectivity and demand. Next slide. I'll kick off our findings with this one. And please note that each of our findings includes an illustration on the bottom left corner. These are intended to provide an example of how people's lives are impacted by each of these issues. So SEPTA's regional rail network was created through a century of infrastructure investment and mergers. The assets are tremendous, tracks, stations, bridges, tunnels, some constructed by SEPTA, but some of which are a century old or older and stem from Reading or Pennsylvania Central Railroad investments. This is a huge asset for the system, but also means continuous attention and upkeep. Regional rail has been designed to facilitate nine to five suburban commuters, even though regional rail also runs through low income communities of color in the urban core. The majority of the ridership before COVID was between the suburbs and center city during peak periods. The majority of regional rail, rail riders were also white, wealthy, and from a household with more than one vehicle. This transit market has been the most impacted by COVID with many office workers working from home. White collar transit ridership levels from before the pandemic are not expected to fully, fully return. In addition, in addition, most areas with higher proportions of low income and minority residents are within the city of Philadelphia. Transit riders who live in Philadelphia working in Center City mostly take other modes um, such as bus and rail transit, even when they live along a regional rail line, which could get them to Center City more quickly. Some neighborhoods like North Philadelphia East of Broad, where many Hispanic residents live, have a regional rail line cutting through their neighborhood, but no stations. Next slide. The regional rail network often has parallel bus and trolley routes, but different frequencies and fare structures cause regional rail to be isolated from the rest of the SEPTA network. Many bus routes closely parallel rail routes or connect into rail transit to bring riders into Center City. Before SEPTA, bus and rail transit were operated by three for-profit companies that competed with the railroads for passengers. Even though SEPTA is now one system, one regional rail trip is between two to four times as expensive as a bus or rail transit trip, even if it takes passengers from the same areas. Next slide. So we want to ask you another um, question and really you know, get into how you might change your behavior if we made certain changes to the regional rail network. So we wanna know, would you ride regional rail more if fares were the same as bus and rail transit? The current infrastructure has the capacity for significantly more service, especially off peak, but a few bottlenecks cap the capacity of the entire network. There are many areas of the regional rail system that are constrained by a number, by number of tracks and therefore how many trains can travel through them at a time. In addition, Amtrak owns a significant portion of railroad track that SEPTA uses, creating situations out of SEPTA's control. Next slide. The amenities and accessibility of stations varies widely. The airport line is the only regional rail line that is entirely accessible. Many stations have accessibility issues both in and around the stations, like steep stairs with no elevator and low platforms that make boarding with a wheelchair difficult. Some stations have a lot of amenities and, an ac and accessible means of getting from one side of the track to the other, while others offer little in the way of shelter, safety, or accessibility, 
And that's something we really noticed when we were out in the field. Um, so we would also love to know, would you ride regional rail more if stations were accessible? The regional rail fleet is old. Its replacement is an opportunity to improve the passenger experience and operating efficiency. SEPTA operates several different regional rail vehicle types, which affect accessibility and require different staffing levels. The need to replace the fleet provides opportunity to match service and operations with today and tomorrow's demand. Next slide. A dedicated staff keeps regional rail operating, but staffing capacity is also a limitation to growth. We saw when we were riding SEPTA Regional Rail how much the SEPTA staff do to keep the system running. When we were visiting the control room, we heard it's the human interactions that make everything at SEPTA work. There are many jobs at SEPTA that require unique skill sets, and training and passing on institutional knowledge isn't instant. It takes time. Um, and with that, I will pass it over to Madeline. Another thing we want to make sure to discuss this evening is something that affects everyone every time they ride the network, and that's how often the train comes. The regional rail network starts early and runs late seven days a week, which is amazing, but frequency is low outside of peak hours. While most stations have service for over 16 hours per day, the majority of stations have less than 45 minute, minute frequency in midday, meaning people really have to plan around the schedule and this can really inhibit their ability to move freely throughout the area. Even on the high ridership lines, midday and evening service is often low frequency. So we wanna know if service was more frequent, would you ride regional rail more often? There are limited connection points between regional rail and other modes, and those connections that do exist are often awkward. We're finding that while there are some very nice connections between regional rail and other SEPTA rail transit, there are many that are within a block, but without good signage or that are sort of missed entirely. Some bus connections are infrequent, um, but because the transfer times don't work well, not because they're not nearby. For example, the regional rail lines and the Broad Street line serve North Philadelphia, but are up to a 10 minute walk apart with limited wayfinding and poor sidewalk conditions between them. And so if these types of connections and transfers were better, would you be more likely to maybe take regional rail for part of your trip um, or ride more often? Regional rail is tuned to the needs of frequent riders. It's working well for the people who ride it often, but the resulting complex operating patterns do pose confusion for new or occasional riders. Some regional rail lines have fairly standard schedules where the train stops at every station each time that it runs. Chestnut Hill East is a good example of this. The Norristown line, on the other hand, has a few runs in the morning where certain stops are skipped to expedite travel into Center City. And there are other lines that have schedules that make it hard to know when the train will come and which, it will, which stations it will stop at um, all throughout the day, not just in the mornings, like the lansdale Doylestown line. And so if this type of service was easier to understand um, and it was more legible, would you ride regional rail more? Regional rail is the fastest and highest quality form of SEPTA transit, but it's also expensive to operate. When comparing in-vehicle travel time, regional rail travels to Center City in considerably less time than bus and other forms of SEPTA rail transit. It's also extremely competitive with driving. But regional, and regional rail also costs half as much to operate per seat mile as the bus. But because regional rail trips are significantly longer, and trips are concentrated at peak directions, that cost per passenger is nearly twice that of the bus. And so this is something that we are considering as we're moving through this project. Additionally, many regional rail stations are located in dense walkable places. 
most of the city of Philadelphia can support frequent all day transit. And the level of demand outside Center City and University City are as high as many downtown areas in the rest of the country, particularly when we're looking at case studies in the Western US. So we do think that there are areas outside the city itself that could support regional rail running all day, much more frequent service. While regional rail has traditionally focused on getting people to Center City at rush hour, there are other destinations like universities, hospitals, retail, and other employment centers across the network, many of which have all day demand. Many areas served by regional rail have above average proportions of non-traditional commuters, those people who don't need to leave for work to get to need to get there at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. Frequent peak service doesn't benefit those commuters who are much more likely to be service workers, healthcare workers, or those with non-traditional schedules. There are many destination centers outside Center City as well that influence people's travel patterns, such as attractions, entertainment, shopping, et cetera. And finally, there have been many proposals for significant changes to the regional rail network that we want to acknowledge, such as expansions, infill stations, and additional service. We will be taking these into account as we move through the process. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Christoph to dive a little deeper into the process itself. So we are just at the beginning of this project. I'm already seeing a lot of questions in the chat about what is your plan? And the answer is we don't have the plan yet. We are just beginning to develop that. Um, and this first phase of outreach is really about setting goals. It's really about defining what success means for this network. And the input we are getting from you here, your answers on the survey, what we heard from people doing the pop-ups is going to be used to set goals and then develop a series of scenarios of what the network could look like that represent different ways of meeting those goals. We are then going to come back to you in winter spring of next year um, and show you those choices, um, give you a set of scenarios and ask you which works best, ask you what your preferred policies on fares might be, ask you what your preferred schedules might be. And based on that public input, we will then de decide which scenario to move forward with and go through actually developing how that scenario works and what is required to implement it, and then come back to you next summer with that implementation plan and get public input. And based on that public input, SEPTA can then take action and adopt that scenario for how to move forward with regional rail. So we're considering everything here. Um, we're considering frequency and span of service. How often do the trains run? How late do the trains run? We're considering service patterns. Are trains local that stop at every stop? Are there express trains? Which stops do those express trains stop at? And how does that vary by line? Um, we're considering the relationship to other services that regional rail connects with. We have New Jersey Transit crossing the river. We have Amtrak service overlaying regional rail. We're considering local transit connections and how those work and how they can be improved. We're considering infrastructure upgrades, what's needed in terms of the tracks and the junctions in order to provide better service. We're considering station improvements. How do we modernize stations and make them work better? Um, we're considering equipment. Um, as noted, a large part of the regional rail fleet is in imminent need of replacement. What should those new trains look like? Um, we're considering fare policy, including how fares work with local transit. We're considering operations and staffing. How is this system actually run? We're considering extensions and new infill stations. We're considering the basic business model of regional rail. And in doing that, we have to look far beyond North America. We are looking around the world for ideas on how to do this well. Um, the current regional rail system was actually inspired by international models, and we want to be open to new ideas here. Things like in Munich, where you can see an S-Bahn that is closely integrated with local transit, with great transfers to subways and streetcars and buses, or London Overground, where legible service and clear wayfinding dramatically increased ridership. Or we can even look elsewhere in the United States, like in Denver, that runs all day 15 minute frequency on a commuter rail line using much the same equipment as SEPTA does. We think these results are 
going to operate on multiple time frames. There are some improvements which can be near term, things that can be done in the next five years about changing schedules, about looking at fair policy. Then there's midterm improvements, the kind of things that actually require physical construction. And we also think it's important to set a long-term vision for what this system ought to be. Where are we headed towards so that every step along the way gets us closer to that goal? So um, we're curious to get a little more of your input. Um, and we will launch some questions on why did you last ride regional rail and, and some statements about um, what is best for this network um, and what kind of projects you think need the most attention across the network. And meanwhile, I have been seeing lots of Q&A questions pop up. Um, we're eager to see more of them. And for the rest of the meeting, we will answer those. And with that, I will pass it back to Ryan. Thanks, Christoph. We've gotten a lot of feedback, so we're going to try and get through this and see, answer as many as we can. For those that we don't get to, uh, we're going to create an FAQ and kind of summarize what we've heard here tonight and make sure that we're providing some feedback and context for those answers. So uh, the first one, and I think, Jody, I may, I may send this one to you, but given the pandemic and ridership projections and ridership in recent times and projections, um, is ridership projected to be significantly less or get back to pre-COVID levels? Well, um, right now we are doing what everybody else is doing and, and trying to forecast um, what we think ridership will look like. So we've been looking at, you know, the region and, and how many um, trips are commuter trips and how many of those are potentially jobs that could be teleworked for a certain part of um, for the longer term. So our current projections, as I mentioned before, we're about at 30 percent of regional rail ridership pre-pandemic, we expect that um, over the winter and through the spring that we'll get to closer to 50, maybe even 60%. And ultimately over the next couple of years, we might reach up to 80% of pre-COVID levels. Now there's a bunch of things that we can be doing. Uh, one of them is this master plan um, and uh, shifts in schedule to encourage other ridership um, gains so that people take transit or regional rail for other reasons. So we're looking at all of those things and offering some three-day passes and things of that nature that help help people who are flexing their work schedule and might uh, choose to take transit if they have that option of a more flexible fare product. So that's the best I can offer at this point. Thanks, Jody. And I think I'll, I'll start to answer this next question and maybe hand it to, to Susie to provide some color or context around it. But how does this relate to other SEPTA plans right now, like wayfinding, the wayfinding mass plan for the rail transit network, bus revolution, and trolley modernization? And I think the, the short answer to that is the SEPTA 4 rich strategic plan lifestyle network concept that we talked a little bit about at the beginning, which laid out uh, really our vision for how all of our services work together to create one SEPTA network. And it's, you know, regardless of mode, that it's about taking transit that gets you where you need to go when you want to get there. And then it's that, that kind of show up and go service, regardless of whether it's um, powered by overhead wire or third rail or something else. I think that ultimately all of these facilities and modes work together as one lifestyle network. And I know Susie's done a lot of work on bus revolution. I'm curious to hear her thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I think that a big part of, you know, bus revolution and how um, this project and others are coming together is rethinking what we know about travel demand and, and who rides transit and for what purposes. Um, transportation planning kind of historically has been overly focused on the travel needs of white higher income men. And we're really trying to rebalance that with these um, with these projects and think about what are the needs of, of everybody and get very specific about um, the needs of those who rely on and can benefit from transit most, um, such as communities of color and women and low income folks that do make up the majority of SEPTA riders, even if that's not who makes up the majority of um, SEPTA regional rail riders today. And, uh, you know, Jody mentioned that regional rail right now is about 30% and bus is, you know, uh, up more around, I think, 55, 60% of where it was pre-COVID. So we know that um, 
you know, there's a way to bring all these markets together and not think of them as separate, but think of them, like Ryan is saying, as a, a lifestyle network. Thanks, Susie. So, Christoph, looks like this one should be going towards you. How do other rail operators fit into the study? Uh, operators like Amtrak and NJ Transit. We don't know yet. I mean, I I think that clearly, ideally, this should all be one a one network. Um, that there are people who are absolutely starting their trip on SEPTA regional rail and then getting on the Atlantic City line. There's people, as mentioned in the comments, who are getting on SEPTA regional rail and transferring to New Jersey Transit and Trenton. And there's also a real overlap between Amtrak service. If you're on any of the three Amtrak lines, whether you're going out to Paoli or north uh, to Trenton or south to Wilmington, um, there's Amtrak service and SEPTA service, which is providing very similar trips in many cases. Um, and right now, those are two different schedules, two different ticketing systems. I think it's definitely worth exploring if there are opportunities for those systems to work better together. And obviously, they're all running on the same tracks. And, and one of the things we really need to think about is how those schedules work together so all of that service can be as fast and reliable as possible. Um, so we're open to all of that in, in trying to make a better regional network. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this one with you, Crystal. What are, what are the plans for increasing frequency of service on regional rail? Are you able to run shorter trains more frequently? Frequency of service is very important to me. And I think that that comment, that question echoes a lot of the sentiment that we're seeing in the chat right now with a lot of comments about frequency. Um, and I think the, the note you started at the beginning of this Q&A process, that we're at the very beginning of this planning effort. We don't have a plan yet. That's what we're trying to do this outreach for. And that's what we need to hear this feedback for. Uh, but generally, Christoph, we could hear your thoughts on, on frequency and, and the future of service in general. So I think one thing we can clearly see both from the analysis we've already done of the Philadelphia region and from looking at its peers across the United States and across the world is there are definitely significant portions of this network that justify a higher frequency, where if we ran trains more often, it would significantly increase ridership. And if you simply look at the population density around the inner parts of the system, that's the same kind of population density that other U.S. cities are running light rail trains every 10 or 15 minutes all day. Um, so the justification is there for the frequency. Obviously, that isn't the same all the way across the system. Um, that at some of the outer edges of the system, that level of demand may not be there. So one of the things we're really looking at is where is that frequency the most useful and prioritizing that service. But we also really have to look at the infrastructure. And one of the realizations already is how much the infrastructure limits both the frequency of service as well as our ability to provide uniform headways across the day. Ideally, on a system like this, you'd have a train every 15 minutes. Often right now, you end up with a train in 13 minutes and then a train 23 minutes after that. And the reason for that is um, a lot of times the junctions um, or multiple lines come together. And as one train is passing through, another train can't. But also situations like station conditions. We have a lot of stations that don't have a complete set of platforms on every track. We have stations where express trains on the inside track have to get onto the outside track to be able to stop at the station. And all of that limits our abilities to provide headway. And so that's why this study is about both service and infrastructure. It is what kind of service do we want to provide and what do we need to do to the infrastructure to provide provide that service. And that includes non-obvious things. I think platform height is a really big one. Um, low platforms mean that every time the train stops, that stop takes longer. The conductors have to work the traps. The passengers have to climb up and down the stairs. There's a limited number of doors that are open. Um, so converting a line to having high platforms may allow that line to operate at a higher frequency and allows those trains to, to turn around faster, which allows us to provide more service with the same trains. And that's the other big limitation here. One of SEPTA's limitation is the number of engineers. It is very difficult to be an engineer running the system. It is a very intense training process. Um, and if we want to run more trains, that isn't just about how many trains we have. It's about engineers. So the difference between two two-car trains and one four-car train is the first one takes 
two times as many engineers to operate. Um, and that means the number of engineers we have on staff and the number of engineers we can train ends up being a real hurdle. So we're looking at all of those, but a higher frequency service is definitely one of the things we will look at at these scenarios. So one of the comments builds on that a little bit, Crystal. People are asking about express patterns and service patterns in general. And I know we're doing some work on peer review, uh, particularly looking at our international peers and the, the number of service patterns that they offer and the, the different tiers of service. I'm curious if you can provide some insights on that. Yeah, I mean, essentially right now, what you have on a lot of the system is you have express services that are very tailored to specific travel patterns at specific time of day. And I know we have a lot of riders who take the exact same train every morning and that train works for them. They know if they catch that departure, that's the express, that'll save them 10 minutes. And, and they literally plan their day around that. Um, but that doesn't work for everyone. Um, first of all, there are some people whose work um, schedules are not that reliable and they have to travel at somewhat different times. There are people who are making non-work trips and have to make them at all different times of day. And there's people making a trip for the first time who haven't traveled that line before. And that same express service that makes life so much better for the person who's commuting at the same time every day actually makes the system a lot harder to understand for all of those other riders and can be a real disadvantage. You have a train leaving the station. You want to go five stations down the line, but the train that's sitting in front of you is not going to stop at that station. And what we've learned is those patterns are often very complex so that if you learn what the system is like at 8.30 a.m., you don't know how it operates at 9.30 a.m., which again is a considerable hurdle for people riding for the first time. Um, so we think there's opportunities to simplify those patterns. Even if you have express service, maybe the express service is more consistent, which is a pattern that you see in other systems, um, but again, may take infrastructure improvements. And I think there's places where in the scenarios we consider, do we need more express service or should we actually have less express service? Would it be better to have more frequent trains that all stop at every station? Um, so these are exactly the things we will be looking at. All right, thanks, Christoph. So uh, we've gotten a number of comments about wayfinding and communications about service and real-time information and the availability for service updates, whether it's real-time or finding schedules, just finding information to plan your trip. And I think I'll provide some general context on that. Maybe Christoph or Teresa can chime in after that. But uh, a couple notes on advocating for those whose first ling language is not English. And I think this is a, a point that's spot on. If you look at the research that we've seen from the SEPTA Wayfinding Master Plan for the Rail Transit Network, which will ultimately inform a lot of the communications recommendations and wayfinding recommendations for the Regional Rail Master Plan, reimagining Regional Rail, there's a lot of the same insights that we're going to be pulling into this, and that's the people that are new to the city or unfamiliar with the system, um, which are very much people who may not have English as their first language as a preference um, is something that we're trying to incorporate into all of our the nomenclature of our systems and the signing so that it's easy to navigate regardless of how familiar you are with the system or language or capability. So um, part of that, we're also looking at how to improve our real-time information in stations. Uh, there'll be some recommendations out on this plan as we go, but hearing this feedback, we know it needs to be prioritized as we move forward. It's something that we're working on um, regularly. And if you have any feedback on wayfinding generally, I invite you to look at map.septa.org, which has a lot of great concepts right now. Uh, we're looking for public feedback on that. Christoph or Teresa, anything that you want to add on, on the communications part of this, particularly related to service? Sure, I can. Um, we just, we recognize that the legibility of the system, um, that clear communications, easy to find on the website, on social media, clear wayfinding, we know that this is absolutely critical for those who are not riding regional rail every day um, because the experience of the new rider um, informs how and, and when they will or if they will ever ride again. Um, so I, we have been reaching out so that in addition to the Wayfinding Master Plan, we have been reaching out to um, riders and non-riders alike through intercepting people where they are, talking to them about what about regional rail um, do they like, um, if they don't ride, why don't they ride as so that we can kind of get at these barriers and better improve um, communications um, to uh, make that easier in the future. 
No, and, and I mean, as we wrote the system, we experienced this. You know, there, there, there. If, if you're waiting in Jefferson Station, you have a high level. You know that every train that comes down the track is going to stop there. You've got a real time display that's telling you whether it's running early or late. You have announcements. You can feel very comfortable about what's happening with your train. We were standing on the platform at Taconi and there's no real time information and you don't necessarily kind of have to judge that you read the schedule correctly and the next train down the line isn't an express that's going to stip you. Like that feeling of waiting at a station and not being 100% sure that a train is coming for you, it really can turn people off from a system. So I think the legibility of a system and, and the level of passenger information is an incredibly important part of this. And again, something that if we look at peer cities across the world, across the country, um, we can see cities that, that do a lot more of that. Thanks. And, and Teresa and Christoph, I think, Teresa, you might want to take this one. Uh, so parking is a chronic problem at regional rail stations. If you don't get there early, you cannot park. What is the plan to resolve this problem? I know um, that, that may be, uh, Teresa, directed towards you for now. <laughs> sure. Um, so we are definitely looking at what that first last mile connection looks like because um, we are seeing that some stations parking is a very real issue. Um, but then at some other stations, it's not. You have plenty of parking spaces and it's really underutilized. So the important thing that we're looking at is um, what does that first last mile look like? What is the surrounding land uses? What is the density of the land uses, the density of the road network? Um, current mode of access to the station. So we can make some broad kind of typology type recommendations for um, what uh, the access to the station looks like and uh, the amount of parking at, at some stations. All right, and Christoph, I'll direct this one towards you with the set of a plan for increasing uh, accessibility at stations in general uh, and across the regional rail system? I mean, it, it's clearly a huge issue. Um, if you are in a wheelchair today, there's large parts of the system which are simply not available to you. Um, and obviously SEPTA has done station up Grades and, and that picture has improved, but there are still major gaps and that is a very important issue. And it's not just an important issue for people in wheelchairs. I, I think that if you've got a stroller, you're dealing with the same exact issue. If you've got a suitcase, you're dealing with the same exact issue. Um, and as I noted earlier, the, the lack of high level platforms actually also slows down the entire network since boarding is slower. Um, and so, that I think will end up being a really important part of this. It's also a really capital intensive part of this. These station upgrades are not cheap. Um, and SEPTA has found ways to do things like prefab station platforms to, to make it as economical as possible. But it is a real issue of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stations on the system. There's a, there's a lot of work to do on the accessibility front. And I think that, that has to be a big part of this plan um, to really make the system more useful to more people. The other thing I'll note on that is it's not just the stations themselves. Our experience at some of the stations was that even once you leave the station, are the sidewalks around the station in good condition? Are the crosswalks safe? Can you safely get to that station? And so this is something that goes beyond SEPTA, that, that the city of Philadelphia, other municipalities, counties may need to play a role in thinking about how the surroundings of a station make it safer and easier for people to get to that station. And I think you just answered one of the other questions in here that's, uh, will this plan include looking at which stations might need better infrastructure, including high level platforms, accessibility improvements, et cetera. I think you just uh, kind of nailed that right on the head there. So this one, Susie, I think you might be the best person to answer for it, but how, how do you go about figuring out the demand for frequency? Um, so, we do this really often in transit planning exercises where we look um, at the underlying demand for transit based on population densities, employment densities, um, land use types, and also what kinds of jobs are there and also socioeconomic uh, factors because some folks are so much more likely to ride transit than others. And um, we, through, you know, 
looking at research across the country can tie those different levels of demand to appropriate um, frequency levels. And what we've seen in the city of Philadelphia is that through the entire city and the very dense suburbs, there is just, you know, extreme levels of demand um, for transit, for all day frequent transit. Um, in many areas of the city, you know, <laughs> service every five to 10 minutes. Um, and that's certainly a big part of uh, bus revolution and um, but there also are definitely areas outside of the city where we see very high levels of demand um, things like that so there's a lot that goes into it um, but we do see very high levels of underlying demand in in, um, in the city and surrounding areas thanks Susie uh, and Christoph how does the length of our systems compare to those of internationally comparable systems like in Munich or Berlin for example, systems that are exclusively all stop. Let's say this one was directed at you in the chat, so it made my life a little <laughs> easier. I, I, I like this. It, it, what's interesting about regional rail is it's a it's a real set of very different lines. Um, you've got some very long services. If you're going south to Delaware, if you're going out to Thorndale, those are some really long lines. And then obviously we have some relatively short ones, Chestnut Hill, Norristown, um, Kenwood. Um, if you look at that, a lot of the lines on the network are of a length that other systems around the world do operate all stop service. But some of the outer ends of those lines are definitely at a point where if you were sitting at a train that stopped at every station, you'd have quite a long trip into Center City. And what we really see peer systems doing there is some layering of service where you have an express train that may serve the outer stops and run express further inside, overlapping with an all stops train and probably time transfers between the two so whatever trip you want to make you can make um, and that also can work well with thinking about different parts of the line needing different frequency and obviously you can also do express trains that are peak only um, so one of our things we're doing is actually an analysis of what we think are several good peer systems to compare to and we're not just looking at sort of how many miles of track they have we're looking at what do the service patterns actually look like because we think that's a key part to the success of those systems, not just having a legible service pattern, but a service pattern that works for a range of different kinds of trips. We've got a lot of questions about vehicles as well. As many know, we have the oldest rail fleet in the nation. Uh, and I think the potential for a silver liner for replacement vehicles is very much on everyone's radar. Christoph, um, you provide some, some insights on what the team's looking at from that perspective and how, how the service patterns and uh, other infrastructure improvements might affect that. Yeah, I mean, first of all, we've talked infrastructure already. If we had a network that had all high platforms, we would be able to buy simpler vehicles that did not need to deal with a range of platform heights. Um, and we could actually also make those vehicles easier to roll on and off with a wheelchair. Um, so depending on what infrastructure we have, we may be able to, to, to buy a different set of vehicles and we may be able to improve the infrastructure on part of a network and run a new fleet on that part of the network. Um, the kind of vehicles you have also has to do with what kind of service you're operating, what length of trips you are using, what level of crowding you have. If you go to Japan, for example, in Tokyo, they have some commuter rail lines that are used for very short trips where a lot of people are on the train for only five or 10 minutes. And what you'll see there is a lot of doors in every car so they can get lots of people on and off quickly. You'll see longitudinal seating on the side. So fewer seats and more standing space. If you are, on the other hand, you have a survey service where people are riding for a very long way, you need fewer doors, you want to have more seating. It's a very different equipment type. Um, and right now, in some ways, the, the SEPTA network is, is doing, a, a, doing a one size fits all, which can be really good in that that gives you a huge amount of equipment flexibility. Um, but you already have things like the push-pull fleet being used for certain express trains and intentionally scheduled on trains that have fewer stops. Um, so what kind of equipment you operate is a really key part of this. The other real lesson when we look around the world is often new equipment can really do a lot to stimulate ridership. That if you look at something like um, London Overground, it, the introduction of new trains really changed how people saw that service and how people use that service. Um, 
So with such a large part of the fleet ready for replacement, we don't want to go into this and say we should just buy the same cars we already have. We should we need to ask what kind of system do we want to operate and what's the best equipment for that system. Thanks. We're going to keep this one with you, Christoph, too. It's a pretty blunt question of what are the current constraints preventing 15 minute headways? I think you just hit on a little bit with vehicles because I know that's a big part. There's a, there's a lot of them. And, and I mean, what's frustrating about this system is there's a lot of places where you come darn close to having everything you need for 15 minute headways, but then you have very specific constraints. We're talking about platform configurations at Wayne Junction, where you've got one line coming in that's a double track line, but only one of those tracks has a platform, which means effectively it's a single track line through that station. Um, the interlockings, particularly on the Reading end, you can really tell the history that the Reading wasn't quite as flush with cash as the Pensy was. And, and so you can see the interlockings on the Reading end, the places where two lines come together are often very particular bottlenecks. And in talking to the planning staff, I mean, I'm amazed at the ingenuity that's built into these schedules, the degree to which schedules are adjusted by a couple of minutes each way so that trains will not meet at that junction. Um, and we have an infrastructure that has multiple of those points. Uh, there are some on the Amtrak side as well. As for example, both cases where the trains to Wilmington and Newark have um, sorry, Wilmington and Newark on one end and the trains to Trenton on the other have to merge into the Northeast Corridor. And at that point, you're intersecting Amtrak service. So every time Amtrak makes a schedule change, SEPTA has to adjust its schedules to work around those Amtrak schedules. Um, oh, there's a very limited set of those sort of points, but they can have a very big influence on the ability to operate the network. Um, there's a little bit of freight train interference, especially out in Norristown that we have to worry about. And as noted, the stations themselves, the longer a stop is at a station, um, the harder it is to provide that frequency. Um, and so again, like we said, there's a lot of really great infrastructure here. It's actually a really good starting point. And we are hoping that there's a series of very strategic improvements that can unlock some of that. And we're also looking at where can we operate that frequency with the infrastructure we have today. So I'll, I'll take this next question. Which is, so what is SEPTA doing to get rid of the bottlenecks? And that's really what this plan is about, is identifying and establishing goals so that we can prioritize which bottlenecks we go after first and prioritize our, our capital and operating funding to do that. Obviously, a lot of that costs money, which leads to one of the other questions of this will cost a lot of money, potentially. Um, so are you going to look at funding options? And Jody, do you want to provide some context on that? Yeah, um, just for some perspective, um, SEPTA has a capital budget um, that is much less than uh, similar systems of our size. So we've been doing a lot with a little for a long time. And that's why we have one of the oldest rail fleets um, in the country, or the oldest. And uh, so funding is a problem. It's a challenge. And um, providing a real assessment of what our system could be capable of uh, the number of riders we could uh, bring to regional rail. That's one of the, the priorities for this, this uh, planning effort is to put forth a realistic plan that shows the costs of the improvements that we're proposing and then put together that funding strategy to support it. So like I said, we have, you know, we receive uh, about half or maybe on a good day, two thirds of what a, a similar system to ours receives in terms of funding. And, um, you know, we're working with the state legislature um, to make sure that the funding that we receive remains um, consistent and potentially increases, and that we have a source of funding that allows us to finance costs that need to be spread over a number of years, like a new rail fleet. So while I'm looking forward to Silver Sixes, uh, Silver Liner Sixes, uh, the new the new fleet um, that would replace the silver fours that are out there today that make up two thirds of our fleet. There's no way we can procure the, or buy those cars without being able to finance them. So we're looking to have that kind of bondable funding source from the state. And then we're all very optimistic and excited about 
the infrastructure package that the federal administration is looking at now and the potential for additional funds um, for legacy or older systems like ours. Um, and so far that looks pretty good. Thanks, Judy. Uh, Susie, this, there's a follow-up question to Susie's response earlier about how we, we forecast demand. Um, does your analysis of demand account for induced demand? Um, that is the provision of better, more frequent, faster service and how that um, is incorporated into identifying demand. And then yeah. also how, how it accounts for special events that, that the city has a lot of, particularly on weekends and, and um, in the evenings. Hmm. Um, yeah, so the, the first is uh, that we, um, it, it's, it's the, everything I talked about is, you know, really a starting point and it is supposed to get at that, uh, you know, really like underlying demand despite um, the service levels. And of course, service levels affect demand, um, but it's, uh, you know, a place to start and we know where we know that um, we're able to scale uh, <laughs> scale services to meet what we think is the underlying demand. And then, um, you know, a big part of it is seeing how ridership actually responds and then uh, responding to that change in ridership as well is usually kind of the dance of how we <laughs> use uh, the service planning. And then in terms of um, special events, that's a little bit trickier. Uh, that doesn't, um, you know, just show up on a map in the same way of using all these different, um, uh, you know, data sources and, and things that we understand. And, and those are things that we need to look at more on a case by case basis. But of, of course, um, we do look at individual locations that we know have more specialty demand. Um, you know, I can think of like uh, MBTA, I live in Boston, you know, serving uh, Foxwoods for the Patriots game, things like that. I mean, that's that will certainly be a part of um, this study as well. And that's part of the Lifestyle Network. Yeah, no, I think that's a really important point. We think regional rail could be useful for a lot of trips that aren't work trips um, and a lot of trips across the course of the day. And essentially, a lot of those trips aren't happening on the system today because the current service and the current stations do not really give people the opportunity to make those trips. So this project is about saying what unserved demand is there and how does the system have to change to serve that demand? Thanks. So it looks like we got about 30 seconds back left in this event. So Christoph, I'm going to throw you one last question. So you have a pretty tight time limit on this, but uh, are you going to be looking at infill stations or extensions as a part of this project? Absolutely. We're, we're looking at, there's been a lot of extension projects considered. We will look at all of those and see where there's merit. And we will definitely look at infill stations, including we know there are some places where there used to be stations and there aren't anymore. We'll look at those. We'll look at other opportunities. We were talking earlier today about how the Market Frankfurt line goes directly across regional rail without a station at, the, at that location. Would that be a useful transfer? Would that make the network more useful to more people? So we will absolutely look at those opportunities. All right, and that, that about wraps up our time here. I know we got a lot of questions, a lot of feedback in the chat here, uh, a lot of feedback and comments that we didn't get to yet. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all that information for questions, we'll compile it into an FAQ and provide some information. We'll put it up on our website. I think we can email out to everyone that's on this call as well with some follow-up information. A recording of this will be focused, um, will be uploaded onto our website as well. Uh, and then in the interim, We'll send a reminder out to everyone to take the survey that's online at regionalrailplan.com. And if there's any other feedback you have, there's a phone number, I believe on the next slide that you can call in, um, provide any other feedback you have. Of course, regionalrailplan.com has some other information about the plan. We'll continually update it as we move forward. Uh, but our next big round of outreach will be in the spring. We'll have some softer touch points as we go through the winter with uh, some more surveys, some more information posted on our website, but generally in the spring, you'll hear a lot more detail about the goals and the vision and some potential scenarios so we can get your feedback and make sure that we heard everyone properly through this phase of the process. So with that, I'll thank everyone and look forward to working with everyone. Thanks.